Excellent. So um, we're probably going to get a few people still joining online, but many of you will know uh, that this is the second um, annual International Longevity Policy and Governance Summit. Um, I'm Tina Woods. I'm the CEO of Longevity International, wear a few hats, as many of you will no doubt know. Um, and uh, we're really, really pleased to bring everyone together in its second year. Obviously, following uh, from the last summit, you know, the world has gone through a tumultuous sort of change as a result of the COVID pandemic. So, of course, um, we are obviously, uh, our whole theme for this year's summit is obviously very reflective of that. And we've um, titled it, and of course it's during Longevity Week. And of course we have many of our partners here from King's uh, Deep Knowledge Group um, and uh, so Aging Research at King's, um, you know, here with us uh, today. And our theme is multi-stakeholder global collaboration for health and economic resilience. So that's the broader theme. And so that will be something that we touch upon throughout and this whole concept around the importance of collaboration. So just moving on to the next slide, I'll just very briefly detail um, the agenda for the day. I think you will have seen that on the event, right? So if we can just go to the next slide, that would be great. <clears throat> so, uh, so we'll kick off in about a minute with our welcome and keynote address. Um, then move forward to uh, the global analysis uh, from Dmitry Kaminsky. Uh, so we've taken a picture of, of what uh, the situation has been around the world in terms of response and safety rankings. We then have three panel discussions and they'll be quite fast and furious. We've got a lot to cover in, in 20 minutes for each of the panels. But this is where I hope everyone in the audience, you know, to please do use your Q&A function to, put, uh, to, put, to pose questions. So we'll do as best as we can to go through those questions. Um, uh, we do have a break. Um, we may, depending on timing, you know, that break might be um, uh, shortened a little bit, but we'll see how we're doing on timing. I'm going to be absolutely ruthless with timing. Um, we then have a wonderful section of a, almost an hour of the uh, country, uh, country uh, sort of situations from all around the world, Asia, um, uh, Middle East, uh, North America, and of course, Europe. Uh, and then we have a roundup and close. So we will aim to finish promptly at four o'clock at 1600 uh, GMT. So with that, I think we are ready to start and I will like to hand over to Dr. Richard Chow. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my real pleasure and honor to also welcome you on behalf of Aging Research at King's and King's College London as co-hosts to this program. Um, Many of you are friends in the audience and would have been at King's this time last year when we had the first International Longevity Policy and Governance Summit. And uh, that was a mega event. It seems like a lifetime ago, as uh, Tina said. And many of you were also at King's this February uh, at the APPG launch of the National Strategy document. But now we're all here back online, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all and also uh, Professor Sir Robert Leckler, uh, who will give our keynote speech. So thank you very much, Sir Robert, for uh, joining us. And Sir Robert was, until very recently, the Senior Vice President for Health at King's College London and also Executive Director of King's Health Partners Academic Health Sciences Centre. He is also the President of the Academy of Medical Sciences and a Special Advisor to the House of Lords uh, Science and um, Technology Committee on COVID-19 which Sir Robert will be speaking about this afternoon, what COVID-19 is teaching us about global health and also longevity. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Sir Robert. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, and thank you, Tina. Um, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and thank you for asking me to make some introductory uh, scene setting remarks. So, Amidst the ravages of this pandemic, I think it really is uh, pertinent for us to pause and reflect on what we have learned and what we are learning. And I would congratulate the organizers of this meeting to have given us some space and time to undertake that discipline. So over the last 12 months, and it is just about 12 months since this virus was first identified, there has been of course, uh, a huge learning in the scientific community about COV-2, the virus itself, and COVID-19, the disease that it causes. And I think the rate of progress in scientific understanding is probably unprecedented. 
And that reflects, of course, the advances of technology that allow things to happen faster, but it also reflects a really encouraging and probably rather unusual uh, level of collaboration between research groups. So that is to celebrate. And I think we really should celebrate it because it's been uh, a huge success story. Of course, culminating in some rather encouraging news uh, about the prospect of effective vaccines. And there are several vaccines that are nearing the point of being able to demonstrate efficacy. And so we now finally can see a way out of the predicament that we're currently in. But I think more generally, in my view, this pandemic has emphasized or exaggerated the importance of a series of things that we knew, but may not have been paying enough attention to. And I'd like to very briefly uh, mention six lessons that I would draw from the experience of the last uh, nine to 12 months. But I, I promise you, Tina, I will be brief and I will finish on time. So the first uh, lesson I think is the importance of the One Health Agenda. I'm sure you're familiar with that term. So this applies to the human race because never has it been more apparent, I think, that we live in a global village. We're all connected with each other. And if something happens in a remote country on the other side of the planet, don't think for a moment that that's irrelevant uh, to you because it, it is relevant. So we're highly connected and that this pandemic has illustrated that. But the other aspect of One Health, of course, is the interface between the human race and animal species. And I think we need to give more attention to that. We need more surveillance of what's going on in animal species, and we need more surveillance of uh, pathogens that transfer from animal species to man. And I think there's much more of that happening than probably we realize uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think the One Health Agenda uh, is really the importance of that is highlighted by COVID. The second lesson I draw is, uh, referring back to something I said earlier, the real importance of collaboration and cooperation in our scientific agenda. It's crucial to progress. Uh, and I think the reason I'm inclined to give extra emphasis to that is because, of course, the UK is about to leave the European Union, which the scientific community has been uh, very much against as a political decision, but it's now upon us. There's no point in crying over spilt milk but we need to work doubly hard to ensure in the UK that we maintain international links and partnerships and collaborations because they're key to good science. The third lesson I would draw is the uh, horrible impact of health inequality and that we must address this scandal. It is indefensible in this day and age that we have the inequalities that we see within a country like the UK between particularly perhaps the North and the South, but even within London, within communities in London. You may know that if you travel on the Jubilee Line from Westminster to the end of the Jubilee Line in the east of London, you lose roughly one year of life expectancy for every tube stop. That is unacceptable. And the virus, if it's done anything, it has exaggerated inequalities and it's shone a spotlight on this problem. So low socioeconomic groups have fared worse. Ethnic minorities have borne an un fair burden of this disease and of course we're now confronted by an economic downturn which tends if we don't mitigate against that to punish the vulnerable. The fourth uh, lesson uh, for me is of course the biggest risk factor for severe disease and it's obviously very topical in this meeting is uh, age, old age and that for me highlights our need better to understand why that is the case. So of course there is some understanding of the aging of the immune system and what's referred to as immune senescence, but in my view it's a little bit of a Cinderella subject and I think we need much better research to understand why aging has had such a dramatic effect on outcomes in this particular disease. My penultimate uh, lesson is the importance of giving ever greater emphasis to health promotion uh, and prevention. It's obviously a no-brainer that it's the most sensible thing to do, but despite that, we don't give it the priority that it deserves. And I say that in the context of the pandemic because uh, other than age, uh, the other risk factors um, are modifiable 
risk factors. So obesity, most notably diabetes, uh, and to some extent uncontrolled blood pressure. These are some of the risk factors for worsening disease. So I think we need to bear down ever more uh, on those modifiable risk factors. And my final uh, lesson learned, I suppose, is that I think this pandemic has highlighted the need for more resilient healthcare systems. Now, if you look in the UK, the National Health Service has coped just, and I think it's to be greatly congratulated for that. It was a very impressive shift that the NHS put in across the country, hospitals turning themselves into COVID hospitals overnight almost. But of course, that means that there's a huge backlog of routine clinical care that's been displaced, which is now coming back to haunt us. So I think we need to work harder at making our healthcare systems more resilient by making them more sustainable so that they can, they have the capacity, the spare capacity to weather storms like this. Because if you can be sure about one thing, this won't be the last pandemic uh, that we'll need to weather. So those will be the, the lessons that I would highlight. I'm sure others of you will have others that I've um, omitted. But I think, as I said at the beginning, there's much to celebrate about the way the scientific community has turned its weaponry on this virus. It's been extraordinary to watch and great insights have arisen and vaccines and new treatments and diagnostics now coming. But I think there's some really important lessons for us to take forward as we think ahead. And, and I think this summit is going to focus on some of those. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, really appreciate those uh, insights and the lessons that we're all learning through this pandemic. And um, we at King's and Aging Research at King's are also addressing some of these in our uh, basic and also clinical studies. So uh, thank you very much again. And I'd also like to thank our partners at this conference and also of Aging Research at King's, that's Deep Knowledge Ventures and also the Biogerontology Research Foundation for their kind support.